If you live in the Santa Clarita Valley, it's a name you see every day. A town, a company, a hospital, schools, roads, a park, a historic ranch, and a whole new community yet to be built. That name, of course, is Newhall. Our community's connection to that name stretches back 140 years and begins with one man, Henry Mayo Newhall. What started with the purchase of a bankrupt Mexican rancho has blossomed into an eight-generation legacy that continues to shape our community today. Henry Mayo Newhall's descendants are scattered across the United States, but some still make their home in the community that bears his name. The company that bears his name is still building on the land he purchased. And the foundation started by his heirs continues a tradition of philanthropy that he personally exemplified. From generation to generation, the Newhall family has epitomized the ideals of service, community building, sense of purpose, and commitment to the greater good that marked the life of their most famous ancestor. And so it is with a keen awareness of their influence in shaping the community we enjoy today, and with immense gratitude for their vision and generosity, that we honor the Newhall family with the College of the Canyons Foundation Silver Spur Award for Community Service. Such recognition would be fitting in any year, but it is especially appropriate in 2015. This year marks the 25th anniversary of the Silver Spur Award. It is also the college's 45th anniversary year of service. And it was 140 years ago, on January 15, 1875, that Henry Mayo Newhall purchased the land that comprises much of what we call the Santa Clarita Valley. Henry Mayo Newhall was born on May 23, 1825, the fifth of nine children. His grandfather was a prosperous shoe manufacturer and trading ship owner in Saugus, Massachusetts. He was born in New England, where his family had resided for seven generations. That's not 70 years, it's not seven years, it's seven generations. And he was the one who moved away. At age 13, Henry chose ships over shoes. He signed on to become a cabin boy on a ship. He told his parents they were going down to the West Indies, and not quite the truth, the ship was going to the East Indies. So they sailed down around Cape, uh, Cape Horn in South America and headed to the Philippines. A fall from the rigging broke both legs, forcing young Henry home to Saugus to recuperate. But he soon left home again in search of work, landing in Philadelphia. It was there, at 15, that he learned the skills that would lead to a successful career in business. An auction house put him to work, moving goods from storage to stage and back. It was a dirty and demanding 12-hour-a-day job designed to test the mettle of newcomers. His bosses were sure Henry would quit. But each morning, there was Newhall cleaned up, bright and ready for business, one biographer recalled. Henry eventually headed to Nashville, founding his own auction house with a partner. And in what would become a recurring theme throughout the young entrepreneur's life, success soon followed. He was a gifted man. He seemed to couldn't do anything wrong. No matter what he did, it turned successful or to gold or something like that. I didn't mean gold literally, but like King Midas, everything he touched came out well. Uh, there aren't many people with that kind of charisma today. There are some, obviously, but not that many. And he was sort of self-taught and self-made. Established in business, Henry turned his attention to familial pursuits. He married Sarah Ann White in October of 1849. But instead of settling down in wedded bliss, a new opportunity had him on the move again. This time, it was gold. Henry arrived in California on July 5th, 1850, after sailing from New Orleans and crossing the Panama Isthmus. Like thousands of other fortune seekers, he headed for the hills in search of gold. And like most who did, he found nothing more than frustration. Miners averaged a dollar a day in gold dug from the hillsides. Never mind riches. That wasn't enough to feed a man when inflation and demand pushed the price of bread to 75 cents a loaf. Discouraged and broke, Henry Newhall walked back to Stockton. He had stored a trunk there with some extra clothes. It was all he had left. But it was enough 
to build a fortune. Using an old barrel for a makeshift auction block, he sold a coat, boots, and shirts, netting $300. He invested that capital in four damaged boxes of dry goods and a steamboat ticket back to San Francisco. There, he planned to sell the dry goods, buy passage on a ship, and return home to his wife in Nashville. But while he waited, he looked for ways to make some money. He had arrived in California with $8,000 and was determined not to leave empty-handed. The owner of an auction house, by coincidence a fellow New Englander, was in need of a seasoned auctioneer. Newhall told him, I can sell more goods and for bigger money than any man that stands in California. He backed up that bluster that very night, clearing out a stock of slow-moving goods. Seeing that commerce was California's real opportunity, he auctioned off his return ticket and stayed on at the auction house. Within two years, he owned that auction house and decided that his heart belonged to San Francisco. He built a stately brick home and then headed back to Tennessee via Panama to bring his bride out west. He had been gone for most of their marriage. At the same time, uh, Sarah decided it was time to go see Henry. So she departed Boston area, came down, stopped, and got off at the Isthmus. And by gosh, if they didn't meet each other, crossing. The reunited couple settled in San Francisco in 1852 and welcomed their first son, Henry Gregory Newhall, a year later. Two more sons followed over the next three years, William Mayo Newhall and Edwin White Newhall. But tragedy struck the young family, and after just nine years of marriage, Sarah died in childbirth. A little more than a year later, Newhall remarried. His new wife was Sarah's younger sister, Margaret. They soon added two more boys to the family, with Margaret giving birth to Walter Scott Newhall and George Almer Newhall. Henry Mayo Newhall, meanwhile, continued to grow his business as the city of San Francisco boomed. He invested in land, having an act for finding and buying inexpensive property in the path of the city's growth just before it shot up in value. Another investment, this one accidental, didn't appear nearly as promising. But again, with the right timing, and Henry Newhall's seemingly Midas touch, it took off. After paying off a defaulted loan for which he had co-signed, Newhall found himself in 1860 with a one-third interest in what would become the San Francisco and San Jose Railway. Within four years, Henry and his partners raised $2 million, built 50 miles of track, and opened a profitable new railway. The partners eventually sold it, bringing Henry Mayo Newhall a handsome profit and a new chapter in his remarkable story. Henry began buying large swaths of California land that had been Mexican ranchos. Squeezed by debt brought on by prolonged drought and mounting legal expenses stemming from California statehood, families were forced to sell off their lands. By 1875, Newhall owned land up and down the state, from north of Sacramento all the way down to Los Angeles. What prompted him to invest this far south is a mystery. It likely was the price, $90,000 for 40,000 acres. Or like many of us, he was drawn, perhaps, to its simple beauty, a wide river valley tucked between two mountain ranges and punctuated by rolling oak-studded hills. Today, we know the Rancho San Francisco as Newhall Ranch, a name given to the property by Henry Mayo himself. The holding originally stretched from the Newhall Pass on the south, north to Castaic, and west to Piru Creek. Immediately, Newhall began making the land productive. Irrigation enabled thousands of acres to be cultivated with wheat, alfalfa, corn, sugarcane, and numerous fruit trees, including oranges. While production on the ranch in the Santa Clarita Valley soon matched that of his other holdings, Newhall's vision for the property was much bolder. He wanted to build a city, and again, his timing was impeccable. New railroad tracks approached the ranch from north and south and would later converge in Soledad Canyon. He granted an eight-mile right-of-way for the line to cross his ranch, and he deeded a square-mile parcel for a town site named Newhall in his honor. He gave a lot of thought 
to uh, what the town should contain. You know, mostly about livery stables and stores, and um, yes, even saloons. And then he uh, started uh, having the hotel built, the Southern Hotel, which is here from 1878 to uh, 1888, I believe. And he literally created a tiny, almost metropolitan center in this town. What he started was in a way very similar to what happened uh, 90 or 100 years later in the creation of, uh, of Valencia and the growth up here now. Henry named streets after those in Philadelphia where he had spent his teen years, race, arch, chestnut, walnut, market, spruce, and pine. He also erected a school, knowing it would encourage families to move in and populate his new town. Newhall's town was off to a promising start, but sadly, he would not see the dream realized. He died in a very tragic way. He was riding a horse, and uh, the horse threw him up, up in the air, and he landed on a rock, hit his head, has severe neck injury and died a few days later. It's, is that a great story? No, but it's a, it's a tragic end to have what otherwise would have been many more productive years, I'm sure. In just about 40 years, Henry Mayo Newhall had gone from being the adventure-seeking son of a New England shoemaker to a fortune-hunting 49er, a gifted auctioneer, uncanny real estate investor, railroad entrepreneur, cattle baron and town founder. It was a uniquely California story and by any measure, an amazing life. And one that would leave an indelible legacy. In 1883, a year after Henry Mayo Newhall's death, his widow Margaret and his five sons incorporated the Newhall Land and Farming Company. Its various operations enabled the family and its burgeoning third generation to live comfortably, pursue business interests, and engage in philanthropy. As cash was needed, land was sold from the family's six California ranches, which totaled more than 143,000 acres. But the Newhall Ranch remained largely intact. After the initial burst of activity and investment following its purchase, the ensuing decades saw few changes in ranch life and the surrounding community. Cattle and crops were the dominant features of the landscape. They were later joined by oil wells of varying success, and then, in the 1920s, movie cameras. The close of that decade forced change on the company, which really meant the family. With America mired in the Great Depression, their financial empire teetered on the brink of collapse, forcing some tough decisions. Enter Athol McBean, grandson-in-law of Henry Mayo Newhall. McBean's reputation and business acumen were already well established by the growth and leadership that he brought to the pottery company, Gladding McBean, which he had taken over from his father. Accepting an invitation from his father-in-law, William Mayo Newhall, to lead the family companies, McBean stopped land sales on the Newhall Ranch, he improved agricultural production, made oil exploration profitable, reined in excessive salaries, and successfully erased the company's massive debt. He brought in talented executives from outside the family and ultimately positioned the Newhall Land and Farming Company to begin its second half century. As one family biographer described, a corporation under tight control rather than a haphazardly operated family inheritance. While most of the new halls themselves remained centered in San Francisco, some found the ranch and surrounding area suited them, just as it had Henry Mayo. Henry Gregory Newhall was the son who remained in the local community and managed the Newhall Ranch. In fact, he lived in the Newhall Ranch house, which was preserved and later moved to Heritage Junction Historic Park in Newhall. Henry Gregory had a spur rail line built to Ventura in 1887, and he named the connecting train station Saugus after his father's birthplace in Massachusetts. Another daughter of William Mayo Newhall was Elizabeth, who married Arthur Cheeseboro, superintendent of the Newhall branch from 1910 to 1930. Their younger son, Robert Newhall Cheeseboro, became a large local landowner and rancher. He left much of his estate to Henry Mayo Newhall Hospital after his death in 1996. Cheeseboro Park in North Valencia is named for him. 
And those family members who remained in San Francisco often visited. The uh, New Holland Farming Company built a house or made available a house that had been built as a family house, in other words, for visiting family members. And we took advantage of that. That was 1954 the, in the beginning. And we'd stay out there amid the orange groves. The landmark that I remember the most is the big sign right at the bottom of what is now the, well, the five mile grade, I guess that's what they call it. Uh, it said Newhall Ranch on it. And it was US 99 in those days, there was no freeway. And it was blue, a uh, sign in white, a neon at midnight saying Newhall Ranch. And I said, well, I guess this must be it. Orange trees and lemon trees proliferated the Santa Clara River Valley uh, between here in Piru and Fillmore. It was just, it was beautiful and it smelled so nice. And we used to play out there and a little older when I was 13 or 14, that's how we learned to drive on the little roads on the ranch because there was no other traffic around there. And in the case of Scott Newhall and his wife Ruth, those visits eventually led to relocation. What brought my father here was he was in the newspaper business in San Francisco. He was an editor and he was an employee of a large metropolitan paper, The Chronicle, and he found out this local newspaper here was for sale. And he said, gee, he'd always wanted the chance to publish his own paper and be his own boss. So he bought it in 1963. Between Scott's editorials and Ruth's nose for news, the Newhall Signal and Saugus Enterprise quickly became widely read and talked about. I think his greatest joy, though, was actually working at the Signal as the editor of the Signal and dealing with the daily uh, news in the community day after day. He wasn't afraid to comment on the news and the happenings in the valley. The Ku Klux Klan came to town and a lot of people didn't like the idea. They had sheriff's helicopters all over the place. More sheriff's deputies were here than there were people in the audience. But we got into an argument with one of the uh, people that were running this Ku Klux Klan thing, and uh, he didn't uh, s use his English right. And uh, he made a grammar mistake. And I yelled out, if you're gonna be the master race, at least use master race English. The Klan didn't stay long. But the 1960s saw the start of more lasting changes on the Newhall Ranch and in the Santa Clarita Valley. Small, one-off subdivisions had sprouted up outside the borders of the ranch over the previous decade. But McBean and other members of the Newhall Land Board wanted something more. As Henry Mayo himself had envisioned some 75 years earlier, they set out to build a new town. A self-contained community complete with homes, businesses, parks, schools, roads, and a hospital. It would even include golf courses, an amusement park, and colleges. The 153-acre site of College of the Canyons in fact sat squarely in the middle of the Newhall Ranch. After local voters established the college in 1967, the college's board and administration went looking for a suitable location they found the perfect one in some rolling hills just west of the newly opened Interstate 5 freeway. Unbeknownst to college leaders, however, Newhall Land had other plans for that property. It was to be the location of a new amusement park built in conjunction with SeaWorld. Aware that the college could claim the property through eminent domain, Newhall Land suggested instead that the campus be located on the east side of the freeway, just south of Valencia Boulevard. They priced the land at $10,000 per acre and refunded much of the purchase price after the sale. I can remember just being barren hills and uh, that was before Rockwell Canyon Road was put in. And it was just more grazing land, just like it was for a long time. And what became of that joint venture with SeaWorld west of I-5? It became Magic Mountain. But back to the building of this new town. Newhall Land hired internationally recognized urban designer Victor Gruen to bring the vision to reality. They wanted to establish the uh, residential homes. They wanted to establish uh, retail stores and the roads, divided highways, divided parkways, and uh, the neighborhoods and the paseos, and then they also needed, of course, an industrial center and schools. But what to call this vision? Athol McBean entrusted that critical task to a professional wordsmith. My father, Scott, was looking for a name for this new community. They didn't want to call it Saugus, and they didn't want to call it Newhall because the connotation 
just in the surrounding areas here in Southern California was not good for those names. He wanted to give it a good name all, all around. He thought of some names like Paradise was one he liked. And I reminded him that there was a, also a Paradise up in Northern California. So he dispensed with that. And he thought, you know, we ought to give it a nice fresh name like, like Orange. But there was or already an Orange, California in a county. And uh, we were driving along one day and he said, I know what we'll call it. We'll call it Valencia. I said, yeah, but that's like a Spanish word. He said, that's perfect. This area has roots in Spain and in Mexico. It was not taken, he looked it up in the atlas, and everyone he talked to liked it. It's not a family name. We're just thankful he didn't name it Naval. Another key element of the new community is a hospital that bears the name of Henry Mayo. I think the hospital is one of the best additions to the community uh, that has been done. And I don't think it was a Newhall family member that uh, first suggested. I think it was Tom Lowe, who was chairman of Newhall Land and Farming Company back in the 1970s, uh, 1960s, I think, when they first discussed it. They put together a board of trustees because this area was served by very smaller privately owned hospitals at the time. And if this community were to grow or to gain a name for itself, it needed a good hospital and it needed a good emergency room. And that's exactly what they tried to put together and they totally succeeded. While New Hall Land got to work building Valencia, McBean moved ahead with another initiative that would make a lasting impact and help support this burgeoning community. Like the plan to build an entirely new community, it was an idea inspired by Henry Mayo Newhall himself. Athel McBean went to a board meeting, as I recall, and said, we're in a number of communities in California, in San Francisco, and in the Central Valley, in Merced area, and in uh, Santa Maria, and New Hall Saugus area. And every time anyone needs real help or backing, they'll come to the local New Hall land ranch or farming company and ask for donations. And we try and do our best, and we give donations. He said, what would really do the job better would be a foundation in the name of the founder, Henry Mail Newhall. The family embraced the idea enthusiastically. Founding board members included Bob Woods, a great-grandson of Henry Mayo Newhall who lived his entire life on the Sway Ranch in Santa Maria, and Jane Newhall, a great-granddaughter of Henry Mayo Newhall who often traveled from her home in San Francisco to the Santa Clarita Valley. She would become a major benefactor of the Boys and Girls Club of the Santa Clarita Valley and of Henry Mayo Newhall Hospital. The first local donation that was made here, I believe, was probably to either the uh, a, a church in Fillmore or the New Hall Saugus Boys Club, which was down here and just being formed in 1967. It was formed by Larry Margolis and Reverend Sam Dixon and Dr. James Foster. And we gave them a founding grant of about, I think $20,000 or $25,000. And we've been giving uh, grants to them over the years, ever since. A foundation such as this would have made Henry Mayo New Hall proud. In San Francisco, Henry Mayo was not only a leader in business, but also in philanthropy. He well understood the need to invest in the development of a city beyond its physical infrastructure, that a true community is built from the inside out. Writing about the leading men of the age, one author wrote, there is not a church building, a schoolhouse, a charitable institution in San Francisco to which Newhall has not been a cheerful giver. Henry Newhall gave generously and, quote, with an utter absence of pronounced display, one of his sons said. I think he saw that he was putting down roots and one of his duties was to serve the community. The Newhall family still embodies that same sense of selflessness. The foundation is governed by a 13-member board, all members of the Newhall family. It was publicized throughout the family that if you would like to keep up the spirit of uh, Henry Mayo Newhall, please consider leaving something in your will or giving an outright donation anytime to the Henry Mayo Newhall Foundation. Well, that has worked, and it grew from $5,000 in the early 60s up to the early 90s when I joined the board. It was about $5 million in assets, and then today it's worth about $40 million, the foundation. It's hard to find an organization in the Santa Clarita Valley that has not benefited from the generosity of the Newhall Foundation. The foundation has also been able, able to help many other groups. 
like the Samuel Dixon Family Health Center, like the SCV Senior Center, like uh, the Newhall School District, which will be underway with a new theater very soon, the Saga School District with an after school program, College of the Canyons, Henry Mail Newhall Hospital, CalArts, almost every group you can think of, the SCV Youth Project, and it has done so much, I think, for the community all around that uh, there's uh, everything you could say about them is almost an understatement of how they have helped. College of the Canyons is particularly grateful for the Foundation's ongoing support. From the library to the Early Childhood Education Center to scholarships and the Medical Lab Technician Training Program, the Henry Mayo Newhall Foundation has partnered with the college on some of the most innovative endeavors, providing the funding to launch new programs and services that yield amazing benefits to students and the community. Their support helped build the University Center, which has enabled more than 3,000 local residents to earn bachelor's and master's degrees, advanced certificates and credentials right here in the Santa Clarita Valley. The new College of the Canyons Institute for Culinary Education opened this year on the Valencia campus with the help of the foundation. Like their famous forebear, the Newhall family members serving on the foundation's board understand the value of education to allow all who seek to better themselves to reach their fullest potential. It's fair to say the Newhall Foundation has helped College of the Canyons become what it is today and change countless lives for the better. What you are doing is investing in the future. Even Henry Mayo Newhall saw that. He always tried to promote a good education and we feel the same way. Uh, the Henry Mayo Newhall Foundation gives a lot of money to scholarships in the Hart High, in Fillmore and other areas, and at College of the Canyons. And we think it's one of the best places that we can do with our money. The foundation, the company, the town, and the new community of Newhall Ranch yet to be built. Together they form an amazing legacy sparked by a visionary businessman and builder, but ultimately brought to life by his descendants. From generation to generation, the members of the Newhall family have carried forward his example of stewardship, innovation, and success. I think he would be very proud and very impressed. The fact that a city, a community, has grown up in the area which he just remembers as grassland and rolling hills and rangeland of a Spanish land grant. And he, he probably would have said to himself, my gosh, and part of my family made this all come to pass. And I think that would be a very proper self-assessment. He'd be very proud of things. To see a thriving city with highways and byways going through it, planted parkways without billboards on them, I think he would love it tremendously and be very proud. It is a proud legacy indeed, one that deserves to be recognized and celebrated. To that end, College of the Canyons and its foundation are proud to honor the Newhall family and present them with the highest award they bestow, the 2015 Silver Spur Award for community service.